Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes, and if you're stuck in a lockdown like me, I hope you're doing alright. I've been keeping myself busy by refurbishing and repairing this Interface 1 and a microdrive. As you'll notice, the capacitors are already replaced. That was the first job, I didn't think this would be very interesting, but it did actually end up with an interesting failure mode, which we're going to suss out now. While testing it, and trying to format a microdrive cartridge, I noticed the border was just remaining black. So let's have a look in the service manual, which does describe this exact problem. It says if the screen border remains black during the first part of a format, there's a clock problem with the interface 1. So that's where we'll start our investigation. The clock circuit's quite simple. It's just this one crystal, a couple of capacitors, a resistor, and an integrated circuit to the left there. That's IC4. Simplest check is a continuity check, so I basically checked every line I can see on that diagram and highlighted it after I've checked it and made sure that it does have continuity. So we have continuity, that's good. Next thing we need to do is get the oscilloscope out and see what's happening on the pins of this integrated circuit. This was a bit tricky to set up. Uh, I had to turn the spectrum upside down, plug in the interface naked and find a ground for the oscilloscope which is fairly conveniently located on the edge connector on the right there. And we'll start off by probing the uh, crystal itself, and we should get a nice sine wave, which we do. Now the chip in this circuit is just a bunch of inverter gates, and as far as I can tell, the idea of the design is to take the sine wave from our crystal and just put it through all of these gates until the wave becomes a bit more square. All I'm doing here is probing the output of each of the inverter gates, looking to see that the wave continues through the chip, and it doesn't. Eventually, it just kind of stops working as I've marked on the schematic here. I was able to see a wave on pins 2 and 4, but not on 6, 12, 10 and 8, which means that on the clock input for the ULA on our interface, we just had a constant 4.6 volts. Which is great, we found the cause of our issue, those chips are quite easy to find so I'll buy another one and pop it in, we should be working again. And just in case you're interested, here's the logic diagram of the chip we were testing, and I've highlighted the broken inverter. I might have been able to bypass this by bending some legs around, but I think it's better just to replace the chip. As you can see, it's a bit busy around this chip. It might be tricky to replace. We have a transistor just on the end of it, and this very thin patch cable running around it, as well as the capacitor next to it, and the connector above it. There's nothing we can do about the edge connector, we'll just have to be careful not to melt it. As for this patch cable, I'm going to remove it, and then it should be easy to work on the chip without worrying about melting it. There it goes, and this wire is actually coming from the left hand side of the patch transistor, so I can really move it far out of the way. Now we can get to work removing the chip. It's always an option just to cut all the legs, although it's a bit brutish, and I can always do with the practice to remove something carefully. Plus, with the edge connector hanging above it, it's really tricky to get at with the snips, so I thought this was best. I think that's looking pretty neat, I was careful to clean up the solder splashes, and here's the replacement chip. So I popped that in, I didn't put a socket because it wouldn't fit with a socket, and also did remember to put that patch wire back on. Right, let's have another crack at showing this clock signal. What we should see is a nice sine wave like this, which gradually becomes more square, as it passes in and out of the chip, and here it is measured at the various pins as it progresses through the chip on its way to the ULA. The scaling's all over the place because I also fit the curve each time I took a measurement, but you can see that by the end it is kind of squarish and a bit more suitable for a digital purpose. I made a quick test with a microdrive I had lying around that I haven't worked on, and unfortunately it just spanned forever. I can't rule out the interface yet, but it's definitely worth refurbishing this microdrive to make sure that that isn't causing our problem. As you can see, it's made of two different PCBs, a head and a base PCB. These are incredibly fiddly to work with, as I'm about to find out. All of the steps I'm about to take are from ByteDelight.com's page on microdrive refurbishment. Thanks Ben for putting that together. There's also links on there to other websites which might help you to diagnose your issues. The first thing I'm checking is transistor Q2, as this is advised in the service manual when you get the message microdrive not present, which is something I was seeing while testing the interface. Using the transistor tester on this uh, multimeter, I can see that the HFE value of the transistor is correct, it's between 50 and 150. Next up, and this is always a good idea, we're going to clean the edge connectors with a fiberglass pen. 
The idea of using the fiberglass pen I've stolen from Noel, so thanks Noel. Check out his channel, Noel's Retro Lab. I also read some advice that if you do get the problem where the microdrive cartridge just keeps spinning forever, then you need to change the voltage regulator on the microdrive. I checked and I did have a fairly steady 4.88 volts, but I figured there's no harm in changing it anyway. I did say these are fiddly to work with. Well, it's even harder with a camera in front of you, and I didn't get any good shots of replacing that regulator, so you'll have to just take my word for it that I replaced it. What I'm doing here is removing the motor so I can access the back of the board to fit C7 and C9. These generally aren't fitted, but I'm told that they do improve reliability, so I'm going to find a couple of 100 picofarad capacitors and pop them in. Just for reference, here they are highlighted on the schematic. And here's me fumbling trying to clear the joints so I can actually fit the things. You can see why it was necessary to remove the motor to do this, it would have been impossible to access the underside of the PCB. And finally, this big box of ceramic capacitors from eBay has come in useful. Let's get them soldered in. Blue tack comes in useful to keep the thing in place while you're working on it. And there we go. I don't think they'll get in the way of anything, so I'm happy with that. Next port of call is these two electrolytic capacitors either side of the voltage regulator. These are actually rated 0.22 and 0.47 microfarads. But according to the internet, I can just use a 1 microfarad, which is good because I've got a few of those already. These ones are taller than the originals, but it should be fine. It is recommended to replace the rubber rollers as well, and if I can get hold of some I will do that. For now the last thing I'm going to do is clean the tape head with some surgical spirit and a cotton bud. Actually, this is the step that made the whole thing start working. It wasn't working until I did this. The last thing that could be wrong with your Interface 1 microdrive setup is the cartridge itself. I recommend getting a refurbished one which has had the felt replaced underneath the tape here. This is really important, especially if you're getting some temperamental issues like I was. So let's give it a go. The first thing you want to do with the new cartridge is format it using this command. You get to give the drive a name, so I'm going to call it HLD for happy little diodes. I don't recommend using your microdrive out of the case like this, but I wanted to show you it working. Let's hit return, and we should see the border flashing black and white, which implies our clock repair has gone right. And it has, that's good. The whole process takes about 30 seconds, I've cut it short here so you don't get bored. Now let's write some code to try and save to the cartridge. I'm going to go for the classic 10 print 20 go to 10. The save command looks a lot like the format command. You have to throw in this asterisk, M for microdrive I guess, 1 for the first microdrive and then type in a name for your program. I'll call it diodes. Hit return, the LED comes on and it's saved. I've restarted the machine for the purpose of this example and I'm going to use the command cat1 to read the contents of the cartridge. And the command returns the name of the cartridge, HLD, the list of the programs on the cartridge, there's our program diodes, and the remaining storage capacity left on the cartridge, 82 kilobytes. I've entered a load command, just like the save command we just used. It says OK, it's loaded the code, and we see it. And if I hit run, it's going to loop and say like and subscribe. And here's the repaired and refurbished interface and microdrive, put back together and cleaned up. Thank you all very much for watching.